Welcome to this fourth tutorial on the explanation of the result tables. First, the hold down design is present for all four cases, which are wind design, flexible and rigid diaphragm design, and seismic design, flexible and rigid diaphragm design. The table for all four cases is similar, thus for demonstration purposes, the table for wind flexible design analysis will be used. The hold downs are separated by their respective level and further classified by their respective shear line. In the table, it is possible to find the location of the hold down attachment, whether it is to a vertical element at the left or right end of a wall, or to the right or left of an opening. The coordinates of a hold down are also given for the plan view. For wind load case, there is an extra column specifying which load case was critical in the hold down design as it can be seen in the legend. To the right of the load case for wind design and to the right of the coordinates for seismic design is the hold down forces such as the shear overturning component including the perforation factor, the uplift wind component for wind design or the factored vertical earthquake component for seismic design, and finally the combined force, which is the sum of all forces previously mentioned. Finally, the last three columns represents the hold down used, its capacity, and the critical response, which is the combined force divided by the capacity of the hold down. Again here, a critical response smaller than one is necessary to ensure the hold down does not fail and an exclamation point in the capacity column of the hold down represents a warning which can be read at the end of the legend. An example on how to calculate the hold down force will be done for demonstrative purposes. The hold down force is determined by multiplying the force applied to the segment to the full height sheathing. Taking that result and dividing it by the distance between the two hold downs for the segmented walls or the distance between the hold down and the cord for perforated walls, or even the distance between the two cords for a wall with no hold downs, in which we want to determine the shear component. The opening of interest is in wall A1. It is 12 feet from the edge, 16 feet wide, and the height is 8 feet while the offset from the bottom is 0. Going in the elevation view, we will calculate the hold down force to the right of the opening. First, the distance between the hold downs is accessible via the hold down results by the go to table, wind design, flexible diaphragm design, and hold down design, and then in the coordinates section. The two planned coordinates we need are to the right of opening one and the right end of the wall. The difference between the two, 11.75 feet, will be the distance we need to calculate the hold down force. Going back to the elevation view, if you find the diagram text too small, you can change that by going to the settings, format, and then increasing the diagram text on the screen to the desired size. Now, multiplying this force applied to the segment to the full height sheathing of 10 feet, which corresponds to the height of the wall, and dividing that result by 11.75 feet, will give the hold down force shown in the elevation view and in the tables. The option to subtract the hold down offset in the moment arm calculation can be changed in the hold down tab in the settings. Furthermore, it is possible to include joist depth in wall height in overturning moment calculation. It is also here that the amount of the hold down offset can be changed. As for the hold downs, there are tables for the drag strut forces obtained from the flexible and rigid analysis for both wind and seismic load cases. Taking the table for flexible wind design, it can be seen that the table is similar to the one of the hold downs. To the far left is the first column which separates the shear lines by level and then further classified by the wall name. The next column indicates the location of the drag strut forces with respect to openings, while the following two columns indicate the planned coordinates of the force. 
The load case column indicates the critical load case in the determination of the drag strut force, full load and no torsion, or by default 75% load and 15% torsion. In Sherwall's version 10, when using the all heights method for load case 2, the percentage of the load and eccentricities may be modified in the site information tab. The second last column indicates that the drag strut force is due to the load from the west to east or south to north direction, while the last column indicates that the drag strut force is due to the load in the east-west or north-south direction. Let's compare the drag strut force from the results table to the one of the elevation view. Take shear line A to the right of opening 1. It is the same force in the table as in the elevation view. The drag strut forces are determined by subtracting the shear flow at the top of the wall times the distance to the point of interest to Vmax times the effective segment distance to the point of interest. As you can see, the drag strut force calculated matches the one in the elevation view. The deflection table, as well as the hold down displacement table, are only available when the Include Deflection Analysis tab is selected in the Design Settings. The displacement table shows the recent implementation of Shearwall's deflection, which uses the four-term equation in the SpeedWiz commentary. This equation considers deflection from four sources, framing bending deflection, panel shear deflection, deflection from nail slip, and deflection due to anchorage slip. The table is identical for both the wind and seismic analysis, therefore the table for wind will be used for demonstration purposes. The displacements are separated with respect to the different levels, and from there, they are classified by shear line. The displacements are referred to as, for example, A12, which means the second segment on wall 1 on shear line A. The wall group, the force direction, and the wall surface with X or int representing exterior and interior for perimeter walls, and 1 or 2 for interior partitions, are presented beside the name of the wall segment. The next section of the table represents the shear force per unit length on the wall segment the width of the wall segment between openings, and the wall height, which does not include the height of the subfloor above or below the shear wall. The summation of the shear force per unit length on the wall segment for the interior and exterior surface multiplied by the allowable stress design factor is equal to the base shear force shown on the elevation view. For deflection purposes, the strength level is applied, which uses a factor of 1, while the force shown on the elevation view is the allowable stress design factored force. Let's verify this by doing an example. Let's look at wall 2 on shear line A. The sum of the exterior and interior multiplied by the allowable stress design factor for win is equal to the following. Now we will compare it to the base shear force on the elevation view, which is the same. The third section of the table is related to the horizontal deflection of the shear wall in terms of bending, where A represents the cross-sectional area of segment end studs, and the following term represents the deflection. The fourth column is the deflection due to shear, and the fifth column is the slippage of the nail, where Vn is the unfactored shear force per nail along the panel edge. EN is the fastener or nail slip determined from an equation and function of the unfactored shear force and the fabricated moisture condition of lumber, and the following term is the deflection of the nail. The four terms are from the deflection equations shown previously. The following term is the hold down displacement from the hold down displacement table.
Finally, the total deflection is the sum of all the deflections presented in this table. Refer to the legend for a more complete description.